On February 2nd, 1949, a car started to cross a narrow bridge in the early hours of a fog-filled Texas morning. Inside it were two people, Ben and Valerie Hogan. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a massive Greyhound bus crossed the center line and headed towards them. Ben jerked the steering wheel as hard as he could to the right and propelled his upper body over his wife to shield her. The sound of the bus hitting their Cadillac was deafening. Thankfully, they both survived. Valerie Hogan received only minor injuries. Ben, a professional golfer who won 32 tournaments in the last 36 months, was not so lucky and suffered a broken left ankle, a broken collarbone, a double fracture of the pelvis, and other injuries. At the time, people weren't sure whether he would ever play golf again, let alone compete at the highest level. But they didn't know Ben Hogan, having dealt with traumas before, including a hair suicide, he was not going to let these injuries stop him from winning golf tournaments. 16 months later, Hogan walked onto the grounds at the US Open, hoping to continue a run of dominance at the majors and cement his legacy as one of the greatest players in the game's history. To guarantee that, Ben focused on only two things, just as he always did, his wife and golf. While many of his peers were chatting on the course during a round, Ben was quietly in the zone. He wasn't there to make friends. He was there to conquer. Through that steely determination and hard work, Ben Hogan would inspire a generation and craft a golf swing many revered as perfect, one that performed. Jack Nicklaus once said that Mr. Hogan was the best shot maker the game has ever seen. To this day, mysteries continue to surround aspects of his life, and tournament significance divides golf history buffs. But what doesn't divide anyone is the impact Ben Hogan would leave from his accomplishments on home soil to a one-off journey 4,527 miles away in Scotland. This is the story of a boy from Texas who was not destined for greatness, but achieved it anyway. Competition is the greatest thing in the world. If you have no competition, you can't excel in anything, I don't think. Fort Worth, Texas generally experiences moderate temperatures in February, but on the 13th of the month, 1922, something anything but moderate happened. Inside a small family home, a blacksmith named Chester was arguing with Clara, his wife. He wanted to move his family of five back to Dublin, Texas, but she hesitated. He was suffering from a deep depression, and it was at its worst in Dublin. After losing the argument, he left the room. A while later, Chester grabbed his 38 caliber revolver, pointed it at his chest, and took his own life. Early reports were that Chester wasn't alone in the room when that self-inflicted shot went off. No, those reports stated that his son, nine-year-old Ben Hogan, was present. Weeks later, the local newspaper came out with an altered version. It stated that Ben's older brother, who was 12, was the one present with his father. The facts about which son was in the room have never been absolutely clear. Either way, Ben Hogan's childhood ended instantly after that fateful shot, and life would never Never be the same. This would be the first hurdle the youngest of the Hogan family would encounter. After the funeral services, Ben decided to make something of himself, though he wasn't sure what that would entail. He got a paper route to help his family, and at age 11, he heard about how local golf caddies were making twice as much money as he was selling newspapers. He wanted to join the ranks, but they had an initiation. Ben Hogan would only be allowed to caddy at the golf course if he fought and won against another boy. I gave this boy a rough time, and I got to be a caddy out there. With that, he was now a caddy at Glen Garden Country Club. Strangely, there would be somebody else who worked alongside Hogan at this course, who had become a top golfer himself. That name was Byron Nelson. An even weirder coincidence is that these two golfers and the legendary Sam Snead were all born in 1912. Eventually, Ben Hogan began learning golf at an area next to Glen Gardens. The caddies would line up and drive a golf ball down the field, with the shortest hitter, usually Ben, having to pick up all the balls. Denny Lavender, a golfer who grew up with Hogan, said he didn't do one thing right. As a kid, he practically ran at the ball. But he got better, and soon his drive was never the shortest. Ben started saving up money to buy used golf clubs one at a time, and eventually he had his first set. But what clubs was he buying? 
left or right-handed. Seriously, this is one of the mysteries of his early life. In the best-selling book, which he co-authored with Herbert Warren Wind, Five Lessons, The Modern Fundamentals of Golf, Chapter 2, page 29, says that Hogan was born left-handed. But in 1987, he was asked the following by Golf Magazine. You were a natural left-hander who took up the game right-handed, weren't you? Hogan responded, No, the first golf club I owned was a left-handed club that a fellow gave me, but I'm a natural right-hander. Like many of us, golf would captivate young Hogan, and he would start to play at local courses near his home. Unlike many of us, he would play 54 or 72 holes a day. Even back then, he was different from his peers. He outworked everybody, saying, I couldn't wait until the sun went up in the morning to practice. At age 15, he and Byron Nelson had the first of many shootouts at a local caddy tournament. Byron was victorious. Mr. Hogan turned pro around the age of 17, mainly because he had to start making money to keep playing golf. After a few local tournaments, he quickly learned that his game wasn't good enough, so Ben would work odd jobs and continue improving. Then, around 1935, he made another attempt. Still, he didn't earn enough money to continue, so he went and worked at a local course. He would marry his dream girl, Valerie Fox, and proceed to save up $1,400. Ben Hogan decided to attempt one last time to make a living playing golf, this time with his new wife by his side. The year was 1937. It was either make it or break it for Ben Hogan. He occasionally earned cash, but kept digging into that $1,400 he saved. Overall, he was losing money. He found solace at the practice range, which would be his mentor in many ways. As was a man named Henry Picard. The 26-time PGA Tour winner and two-time major champion encouraged Ben to stay. He told Hogan that he could come to him for a loan if he ever needed money. As Ben and Valerie drove to a tournament in Oakland, they had a total of $85 left. If Ben didn't make any money here, he would not take Henry up on his offer and would give up his dream of pro golf. Mr. Hogan didn't win. However, he earned $286, proving to himself and his wife that he could do this long term. The two would have to wait a while for his first victory. It wouldn't happen until 1938. He and Vic Gezi won the Hershey Four Ball. Remember Gezi? If you watched my Mo Norman video, that's the guy who grilled Norman when Mo told him he was leaving mid-round at Augusta. Also, if you notice a key trait between Mo and Ben, two guys Tiger said owned their swings. They developed it through long, focused hours of practice, and as Hogan would say years later, the secret is in the dirt. Ben started to play consistently better, but his lack of winning earned him the nickname Mr. Runner-Up. The great Gene Sarazen even commented, Hogan will never make it. He should have won already if he was ever going to do it. But that all changed in 1940 when the 27-year-old stepped onto the legendary Pinehurst Golf Course in North Carolina. He bested the field at the North and South Open for his first individual victory. Hogan finally did it, and he got a little help from a new golf club. It was a 14-ounce McGregor driver that Byron Nelson gifted him before the tournament. In fact, this club change was so noticeable that in just a few months, Hogan would be called the best driver in the world. Ben said, This new club Nelson gave me. Heck, I've never hit tee shots like that before. Close line drives every one of them. Mr. Hogan would win three more times in 1940 and five times during the next season. He was no longer Mr. Runner-Up, and during these early years, Ben was not a newspaper reporter's favorite person. He would often receive the winner's check and leave without giving any info and denying them the interview, similar to Mo Norman. All that mattered to Mr. Hogan was winning tournaments and making money. He explains why in a 1953 article, I know a lot of people don't like me. They think I'm selfish and hard, that I only think of golf. Maybe I do, but there's a reason. I know what it means to be hungry. I never intend to be hungry again. I never intend for Valerie to be hungry. In the same article, the author states that he finally understood the real Hogan. Quote, he was an outwardly cold and calculating man, but inwardly warm, a man determined to protect the girl he loved. While many Americans' thoughts were focused on World War II after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Ben Hogan was poised to keep improving his game. After a great start in 1942 with four wins, Ben entered the grounds at the Ridgemore Country Club in Chicago to play in the Hail America National Open, a replacement tournament at a different venue for the U.S. Open which was cancelled due to war. Mr. Hogan would dominate and win the tournament shooting 17 under par, receiving a gold medal like he would have if it 
were a US Open and $1,200. He also shot a round of 62 and had it been considered a major, would still be tied for the lowest round in major championship history. It wasn't classified as a US Open, but word got out that Hogan thought it should be. Ben said, if this wasn't a US Open, I don't know what it could be. Everybody was in it. Some newspapers published articles with first major title as the headline, and Ben would, apparently, stick to the belief that this was his first major for the rest of his life. Author Peter May wrote a book in 2021 called The Open Question. In it, he lays out his evidence and argues that the tournament was similar enough, including its strong field, and concludes that Ben Hogan's win at Hale America should be a major victory. He is not alone in that belief. A famous sports writer, Dan Jenkins, said, I count this as a US Open win because the gold medal Ben got looks just like the ones the USGA gives for the US Open winners. Jeff Martin wrote a fascinating series of articles in opposition to counter this. First, he states that the medal was similar because it was intended for the US Open, which was cancelled, and instead of making another one due to wartime cutbacks, they used it for the Hail America. Peter May claims it should count because Sam Snead was the only top golfer missing from the tournament, but nine of 19 players who finished in the top 10 in one or more of the three previous seasons didn't enter. Finally, Jeff Martin concludes with, it should go without saying that if no US Open championship title is at stake, and without US Open pressure, how could playing in the Hail America possibly be considered equivalent to a US Open? As of today, this win has not been recognized as a major championship, and the author of the book Ben Hogan in American Life, James Dodson, has an interesting take on how this affected Mr. Hogan, saying, this was a man who was motivated by failure. The failure to have the USGA acknowledge it was a major championship was probably another source of motivation for him. Ben Hogan would stew over this decision by the USGA while he was called to serve in World War II. Ben Hogan served in the United States Air Force stationed in Fort Worth, Texas during the war. Mr. Hogan, a lieutenant, was a utility pilot and would be discharged in 1945. The most interesting thing about his military service related to golf is that the timing was not ideal for Ben. Before serving, he was the tour's leading money winner in 1940, 41, and 42. He looked to get back to winning tournaments and entered the 1945 Nashville Open, which became his first tournament win since returning. Four more wins followed later in the short season, including a 27 under par victory at the Portland Open, 14 strokes better than second place Byron Nelson. The next year, he fired off nine wins before heading into the 1946 PGA Championship, looking to record his first major victory. This match play event was held at the Portland Golf Club. The third round, quarter, semi, and final rounds would be played over 36 holes. Ben Hogan reached the finals and faced off against Ed Oliver. Oliver got off to a three-hole lead after the morning round, but Ben Hogan turned it on in the afternoon with the final score being six and four. Ben Hogan was the PGA champion, his first official major victory. He would win 13 times that season, the most of his career, and the second most of all time in a single season, trailing only Byron Nelson's 18. As 1947 rolled around, something interesting happened. Hogan broke that magic driver of his, and golf balls started heading offline more than he liked. He would try many different drivers, but none of them worked like his old one. His natural shot was a draw ball going right to left. It had a low, more penetrating flight that would often roll off the greens. This kind of shot was great for long drives on dry fairways, but not so great for pin hunting. Some days he couldn't time it right, and the ball would hook much more than intended. Ben took some time off and decided to change his swing. These changes would be part of his mysterious secret which people still debate about to this day. He knew where to start, something which he had worked on since 1939. At the time, Hogan talked to his friend Henry Picard. Here, Henry shows the gloveless Ben how changing his grip will help. So the first adjustment, and maybe the biggest, was to weaken the grip on his left hand. The second adjustment was the gradual cupping of the left wrist, which you can see here at the top of the back swing. Bradley Hughes, two-time Australian Masters champion, winner on the Nationwide Tour, and ex-PGA Tour player turned golf instructor, explains what that 
did was allow him to then rotate his wrists and forearms open. You can see there, he's done that coming down and the club falls behind him, so it always stays under plane. That's a great photo right there showing. That's not the top of his swing, it's actually starting down. The great Johnny Miller explains how Hogan went through the ball. The Hogan move is when he went through and came down, the face was this way. It's a totally different position to this one, to this one. He had this to say about those changes. No matter how much wrist I put into the downswing, no matter how hard I swing, the face of the club cannot close fast enough to become absolutely square at the moment of impact. The result was a lovely, long fading ball, which is a highly effective weapon on any course. It took him two years to perfect this fade, but with it, Ben Hogan possessed every shot in the game. In 1948, he started strong, winning the LA Open at Riviera, just like he did the previous year, and set his sights on the PGA Championship, played at Norwood Hills Country Club. Hogan thrived at match play because of his intimidating nature and hawk-like ability to pick apart a golf course, which shook his competitor's spirit. So it was no surprise when he found himself in the finals again. His opponent for the 36-hole match was Mike Ternessa. Contrary to popular belief, most newspapers in 1948 report that Ben was out driving his opponent that day. But it was Mr. Hogan's pinpoint iron play which tore apart Ternessa. Ben would win 7-6, and six, the second biggest margin of victory in the PGA Championship's match play history. This would also be his second major title and Wanamaker trophy. He wasn't done there. He entered the field at California's Riviera for the US Open, where Hogan was truly at home. After four rounds, he finished with an eight under par 276. He was victorious, and this eight under par score wouldn't be beaten in a US Open until 2000, when Tiger Woods iced the field at Pebble Beach. In 16 months, Mr. Hogan won three times at Riviera, which would end up being named Hogan's Alley. In all, this would be a 10 win and two major season. And since his return from service till the end of 1948, Ben Hogan achieved 35 official tour victories. He would later say that this season was the best golf he had ever played. By all accounts, 1949 would be another dominating year. However, a freak accident looked to derail his career for good. On February 2nd, 1949, near Van Horn, Texas, Mr. and Mrs. Hogan were headed home to Fort Worth in their new Cadillac. Carefully, of course, because the fog was so thick that they could barely see before them. As they began to cross a culvert, two headlights appeared in their limited vision. A massive bus was heading towards them. Ben had almost no room to move the car over to the right. All he could do was thrust the upper half of his body over, shielding his wife from the impact. This heroic gesture most likely saved his life. In all, he suffered contusions to his left leg, a broken left ankle, a broken collarbone, a cracked rib, a double fracture of the pelvis, head abrasions, and internal injuries. After his bones were set in an El Paso hospital, it looked as if Hogan would be fine. But a month later, blood clots formed. A vascular surgeon made an incision and tied off the veins through which the clots had appeared. Because of this surgery, he would experience leg pain and circulatory problems for the rest of his life. At the time, the public wasn't sure about his condition and if he would ever walk or play golf again. However, some newspaper articles were very optimistic that he would. Moreover, Hogan was determined to get back out there. Golf was my life, but I didn't want to give it up, so I went to work. This would be another obstacle he must overcome another challenge to tackle. Before being released from the hospital, his friend Jimmy Demerit visited him. Gee, Ben, he said, if I'd known you were going to be so upset that you would take on a Greyhound bus, I would have let you win that playoff in Phoenix. Laughter was good medicine for Mr. Hogan. Ben would be released from the hospital and would complete his captaining duties for the U.S. Ryder Cup team in September 1949, and in December he played a practice round at another place dubbed Hogan's Alley, Colonial Country Club. Incredibly, one month after that, he returned to competitive golf at Riviera, shooting a final round 69 and taking the lead. However, Sam Snead birdied his final two holes, tying Hogan, and then beating him in a playoff. Mr. Hogan and his fans now knew he was not only able to compete again, but that he would be also able to win. 
the 1950 US Open was to be played on the spectacular Marion Golf Club's East Course. As was custom for a US Open back then, both the third and fourth rounds would be played on Saturday, a much tougher task for Hogan's current condition. After the first two rounds, Hogan was close to the lead, and after Saturday morning's round, he was two strokes back. Ben was in the driver's seat on the afternoon round, but a bogey on 15 and 17 left him tied for the lead. After a good drive on 18, he needed something special. Ben Hogan, the master of golf course strategy, replaced his seven iron with a one iron that week, stating, there are no seven iron shots at Marion. On the 18th fairway, he pulled out his one iron and hit the ball. Ben saved his two putt par and would be in an 18 hole playoff with Lloyd Mangrum and George Fazio scheduled for tomorrow. The next day, as they finished the 13th hole, Hogan led by a single stroke over both competitors. Fazio bogeyed four of the last five holes and was out of contention. On the 16th hole, Hogan was still holding a one-shot lead. On the green, Mangrum, who was looking at a 15-foot putt to save par, marked his ball because it was in George Fazio's line. Fazio went. Mangrum was about to go, but he noticed a bug had landed on his ball, so he marked it again, blew it off, and made the putt. As they walked to the 17th tee box, Mangrum Mangrum was assessed a two-stroke penalty. Even today, there is much confusion about what happened here. In 1950, a player in a PGA event could mark their ball on the green as many times as they wanted. However, in a USGA event, which this was, a player could only mark their ball if it was in another golfer's line. Mangrum's ball was in Fazio's line, so he marked it, no problem. But when he marked it a second time to blow off the bug, which was not in anybody's line, Mangrum got penalized two strokes. This gave Ben Hogan a Three shot lead with two holes to go. Ben would birdie the next hole and par 18, shooting a playoff round of 69 to win the US Open. An incredible feat considering where he was just 16 months ago. It will go down in golf history as one of the biggest comebacks in our sport. Afterward, he said, Marion meant the most to me because I proved I could still win. Mr. Hogan was back. Through a combination of skill, work ethic, and determination, he climbed to the top once again. The following year, he was victorious at the Masters for the first time and the US Open again. In 1953, the Hawk was set to make history. Ben Hogan experienced a few failures in 1952, including losing the Masters to Sam Snead. They both held the 54-hole lead, but Ben shot a 79 on Sunday. He also had the 36-hole lead at the US Open, but couldn't put in two great rounds to finish it off. His lone win that year was at the Colonial. The 40-year-old Hogan vowed that 1953 would count. Angry at his previous year's failed Masters bid, Hogan arrived at Augusta National two weeks weeks early to prepare for the tournament. He often did this after the car accident, since he would only play a handful of tournaments a year. This master's preparation paid off. He attacked the course with his shot-making prowess, shooting rounds of 70 and 69, and then took command on Saturday with a 66. He went into Sunday with total control of his game. After knocking in a birdie on 18, Ben Hogan was the master's champion for a second and final time, shooting 14 under par and setting the tournament record. Hogan said, I hit the ball better, more like I wanted to hit it, than in any 72-hole tournament I've ever played. Bobby Jones expressed that he never thought anyone would put on such an exhibition at his course, and a bridge and plaque would be dedicated to Ben Hogan for his display of greatness at the Masters. Hogan's season of excellence was just beginning. Two weeks later, he won the Pan American Open in Mexico, and was victorious at the Colonial again. He then lost in an unofficial event, the Greenbrier Pro-Am. Ben would seek revenge later at the US Open being played at the beautiful Oakmont Golf Course. Ben Hogan opened up with a 67 and Sam Sneed shot a 69 on Friday. In the final round, Hogan pulled away from Sneed and put home three birdies on the back nine to win by six. It was a wire-to-wire -wire victory, which has only been done seven times in the history of the US Open. It looked like his season was over, but Mr. Hogan could still go to Scotland for the Open Championship. However, he said he wouldn't travel overseas, which stayed true until he was convinced after receiving a, a telephone call from uh, Walter Hagen telling me that I must go and that I must go uh, 
that year, 1953. The Open Championship was to be played at the world-famous Carnoustie. Hogan arrived early, walked the course repeatedly, and practiced as much as possible to get used to the differences, which were vast. Ben would hit three balls from each tee box, one straight down the fairway, one to the left, and one to the right, so he could see which part of the fairway opened up for the second shot. Even though he was feeling more comfortable on the course, he was feeling a lot of pressure. I felt this pressure on me of having to change my game very fast to fit the conditions and the course and the small ball. Ben Hogan was critical of the course, with comments regarding the greens such as, you can't putt on putty, and the infamous, I've got a lawnmower back in Texas, I'll send it over. The Scots, who were fans of the player they called the Wee Iceman, were also deeply proud of their course, and stated that golfers had always been able to adjust to Carnoustie. Champion golfers, that is. Like the previous two majors, Mr. Hogan would learn the course, especially on the par 5 6th hole, which featured a split fairway. The best line to the green is to send the drive down the out-of-bounds riddled left side. The 6th was renamed Hogan's Alley because of his dominance on it, which saw his ball end up safely on the left in all four tournament rounds. When the dust settled, Ben Hogan was victorious, six under par, four strokes better than the next, in what would be his first and only time entering the Open. This win completed the career Grand Slam, and Hogan would become the first golfer to win three modern majors in one season, which is dubbed the Triple Crown. To date, Ben Hogan is the only golfer in history to be victorious in the Masters, U.S. and Open Championship in the same calendar year. You may ask how he did in the 1953 PGA Championship. Well, Hogan couldn't play in it. The PGA and Open dates overlapped, so winning all four majors was impossible, and he may not have been able to win either way. Never count out Hogan, of course, but the PGA was still match play, featuring 36 holes a day. After the car crash, Hogan didn't play in a PGA Championship until 1960, which was stroke play. The tournament changed format in 1958. Bernard Darwin, a famous golf writer, put it best when discussing Hogan's play at this time. If he needed a 64 on his last round, you were quite certain he could have played a 64. Hogan gave you the distinct impression he could get whatever score he needed to win. It will go down as one of the most dominant years in golf. Five wins out of six tournaments, three of them majors, cementing his legacy as one of the best players in history. He would return to the States a hero, the athlete of the year, and enjoy the ticker tape parade that awaited him. Ben Hogan would stick to his schedule of only playing a handful of tournaments a season, and in the years that followed, he would experience some crushing defeats. The best example of this was his loss at the 1955 US Open at San Francisco's Olympic Club. In a massive upset, Jack Fleck, a golf course pro, prevailed in an 18-hole playoff to win. Ben even said afterward that he was through with competitive golf. However, he would still enter tournaments. In 1956, something truly special happened at the Cypress Point Club. Eddie Lowry, yes, that Eddie Lowry, the child caddy for Francis we met when he won the US Open in 1913. Now a rich businessman, bet George Coleman that his two car salesmen, who were great amateur golfers, Harvey Ward and Ken Venturi, were unbeatable in best ball. What's more, Eddie said they wouldn't lose to any professional golfers. Coleman accepted the bet and persuaded Ben Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson to battle these world-class amateurs. Mark Frost wrote a highly recommended book called The Match, The Day the Game of Golf Changed Forever, which discusses this event. Ben Hogan shot a 63, a course record, and he and Byron barely edged out their opponents. Tournament-wise, Ben wouldn't win another until 1959, the final victory of his career, and it came at quite a fitting place. The Colonial, a golf course that will always be synonymous with Ben Hogan. He won there five times, and a statue immortalizes him on the grounds. During Mr. Hogan's later professional years, he developed more health problems. His eyesight kept getting worse, a problem that started after the accident, and he developed a case of the yips. His putting was never praised as being the best, but like many, worsened as he got older. I recommend watching the 1965 Shell 
Bell's Wonderful World of Golf match, where Ben Hogan takes on Sam Snead. It shows the miserable state of Hogan's putting at that time. But more importantly, Ben's ball striking is on full display. The great Gene Saracen, who, if you remember, once said Hogan wouldn't win, commented, Ben, I want to congratulate you. That's the finest round of golf I've seen in my lifetime. As his playing career was winding down, Ben decided to leave his mark on the golfing world in several other ways. He wrote a few books on how to play the game, the most famous being 1957's Five Lessons, The Modern Fundamentals of Golf. Apparently Hogan himself didn't like Five Lessons, however, that has never been verified. Some detract from the book and point to how it was originally a series of magazine articles, but based on many reviews, it has helped them tremendously. If one wants to learn to swing like Hogan, I would also direct their attention to the book he wrote in 1940 48 before the car accident. It's called Power Golf and even goes into such details as golf course management. Now I suppose you want to understand his swing from a different perspective. Head over to Bradley Hughes's website and pick up his book on Hogan. Mr. Hogan's books, along with what Bradley says, will provide you with the knowledge to improve your game. Another massive achievement for Hogan was related to equipment. He started the Ben Hogan Golf Company in 1953, aiming to make every club look like a piece of fine jewelry. Ben began working on the clubs himself, right along Along his hired workers. The release got delayed multiple times as they were not up to Mr. Hogan's standards. Finally debuting in 1954, the Ben Hogan Precision Irons were an instant hit and have been touted as the granddaddy of all modern blade designs. By 1960, he had a thriving business with sales reaching $1,870,000 and showing a profit of $193,000 annually. Ben sold the company in 1960 to American Machine and Foundry, or AMS where he would still remain chairman, and in 1984, Minstar bought the company. Then, in 1989, the Ben Hogan Golf Company changed equipment forever. Up until that point, Hogan irons were all forged blades, but they were about to release the Hogan Edge, the first mass production iron that combined the feeling of forged steel and the forgiveness of perimeter weighting. The book The Hogan Edge discusses what was happening around this time. During the production of these clubs, Minstar cut union members' wages, which promoted promoted some employees to sabotage the shipments and products. When Mr. Hogan heard they cut wages to increase profits, he was deeply disappointed. Nevertheless, the Edge Clubs were a massive hit. The company would be bought and sold over the years and looked to be dead by 2022. But Simon Millington, a successful entrepreneur who has brought back the brands McGregor and Ram, struck a licensing deal with Perry Ellis and has resurrected the Hogan branded golf clubs. This being a direct to consumer brand means top quality at factory prices, saving the buyer money. I contacted the Ben Hogan Golf Company with a question about their history and what do you know, they responded. So a huge thank you to them. Ben Hogan officially retired from professional golf in 1971 and was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame in 1974. During his last remaining years, he led quite a private life, hardly seen in public and rarely granted interviews, although he still played golf alone at Fort Worth's Shady Oaks. I try to go when nobody is out there, he would say. He suffered from Alzheimer's disease and underwent surgery for colon cancer in 1995. In 1997, he had a major stroke, stopping his heart. Hogan died at age 84 in Fort Worth, Texas on July 25, 1997. The love of his life, the extremely supportive Valerie, passed away two years later. On his passing, the great Jack Nicklaus said, Golf has lost, in my opinion, the best shot maker the game has ever seen. We will all miss him very much. He was a great man. Mr. Hogan stood out from other players in his era. For instance, he wasn't a happy-go-lucky golfer who was just hanging out with the boys while competing, with Jimmy Demerit saying, nobody gets close to Ben Hogan. And for better or for worse, he spoke his mind if and when he decided to give interviews. After a round in 1940, Hogan said, Byron Nelson's got a good game, but it'd be a lot better if he'd practice. He's too lazy to practice. These comments were said to have changed their friendship forever. Arnold Palmer tells an interesting story about Ben and how he wasn't afraid to say what he thought. His exact remarks were, how in the hell did he get in the Masters? And, and of course, when I won the uh, Masters, I, I personally had a little personal satisfaction. 
So being social was not what drove Ben Hogan. He was driven to become the best. To do that, he outworked his opponents. For example, when Mr. Hogan competed in tournaments, he would play 36 holes daily, although not in the way you may think. Uh, when I was playing in tournaments, I'd play the first 18 on the practice tee. And I'd remember every shot I'd, I'd played, you see, and I'd hit that shot until I, I could really hit it right. That consistent effort developed one of the sweetest swings in history. The great Canadian George Knudsen, who studied and deeply respected Ben, once said, When Hogan starts to hit balls, I tell my caddy to put my bag away. Ben outthought his opponents, the course conditions, the type of grass, the wind, high, low, left, right. And like a hawk, he would also study every inch of the course. In turn, this allowed him to outplay his opponents and achieve some remarkable stats. He was victorious 64 times on the tour, winning 9 majors, or 10, depending on who you ask, and is one of 5 modern players to achieve the career Grand Slam. Only he and Tiger Woods have completed the modern day Triple Crown season. Even though Ben only won 2 green jackets, he achieved a streak at Augusta that nobody else has. From 1939 through 1956, Hogan never finished worse than 10th at the Masters. That's 14 consecutive top 10 finishes at Augusta National. This excludes the cancelled ones and the ones he missed after the car crash. He made the cut at the 1939 US Open and never missed another, including his final entry in 1967 at age 54, finishing 10th place or better in 15 straight entered US Opens. He won 13 times on the PGA Tour in 1946 and 10 more in 1948, and remains the only player in history to post double digit wins in two seasons or more. He played in 292 PGA Tour were events and Ben Hogan finished in the top three 47.6% of the time and was in the top 10 in 241 events. And this stat right here is amazing. Hogan won eight majors in just 11 starts from his PGA Championship win in 1948 to his Open Championship victory in 1953. When the car crash looked to derail one of the two things he loved, he was dead set on returning, and he would win six of his nine majors post-crash. This never-say-die attitude, I reckon, is what really speaks to people when they think of Ben Hogan. When it was all said and done, the Hawk achieved much of what he wanted to do. And if there was one quote that explains how he accomplished this, it's when he said, I felt a little sad when the sun went down. I enjoyed golf so much. It was my whole life. I guess you could call me a perfectionist because I wanted to do everything right. And I worked at it every day. His pursuit of golf perfection has benefited every player in one way or another. From being a role model to manufacturing clubs and teaching us how to play this game, Ben's life work has impacted us all. What else can I say except thank you? Mr. Hogan. I've subtracted so much out of this game and pleasures and uh, uh, acquaintances and nice places, uh, nice people that I know and associates. Uh, uh, I've been well rewarded.